A great meeting point, convenient light meals, hot and cold beverages, or a quick snack on the go. What's your order for the day? We don't just say, we do. It's the Stain City Way. Good afternoon and welcome to Real Talk on SABC3, the stage is yours. Now, what are the chances that a son of a Welsh mother and a Scottish father who was born and bred in Ireland would one day end up calling South Africa his permanent home? Well, that's exactly what happened with our guest today. It was his talent and passion for rugby that had him choose to move to South Africa in the 80s. When he could no longer play the sport, he found pleasure in sport commentary, which was what kick-started his career in broadcasting. By the 90s, he was no longer just providing sports commentary, but rather adding what would become one of the most influential voices in news and current affairs in this country. After a successful 17 years as the breakfast show host on 702, 17, John Robbie announced retirement last December and has been on a brand new adventure ever since. We welcome to the show the legend that is John Robbie. Thank you for your time. I know that, I think that's the nicest intro I've ever had in my life. Thanks very much indeed. I think after 17 years of talk radio, not many people have had nice things to say about you. <laughs> there's been nice and there's been not nice, right? Uh, that goes with the territory. But uh, I think over the years it changed a lot. Yeah. And, and it's amazing chatting to some of your wonderful staff behind the scenes. Yeah. Uh, some of whom are about the same age as my... <laughs> <laughs> younger than my kids uh, um, about the old days I mean they look up and you know we tend to think that our era everyone remembers it but of course you know being told to shut up by Nelson Mandela people say Nelson Mandela told you yeah like, doesn't yeah. everybody know that did, did you shut up after they told you to shut up what do you think <laughs> no yeah no 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 it's a, it's, a, it's a favorite story I think Bill Clinton and I are the only two people Madiba ever told to shut up, but it was lovely. And the moment he said it, he said, you're mm. not on the radio now, <laughs> you know, and shut laughed up. and smiled. Yeah, so it's a treasured memory. I was trying to think because I'm, I was like, you know, I'm interviewing an interviewer, right? And, and then I was trying to think how many interviews you must have done in your oh, 17, not even your 17 yeah. years, in your life. Are we at 5,000, 10,000? I wouldn't even have a clue. And, and I, I never thought of them as interviews. You know, they're, they're chats. Uh, You've got this incredible um, opportunity to talk to people. And yeah. I always tried to, to make it a chat. On, on one infamous occasion, by making it too informal and calling a minister by her first name. Mantu. I mean, of course, that <laughs> led to... So, so you know, but I think, I think people forget that in the early days of Talk Radio on 702, it went from being a rock and roll music station to uh. a talk station almost overnight. Mm. So we were making it up as we went along. Mm. It wasn't like now where you've got experts who come in and school you and give you the... The DNA was built by we you. We were thrown in and we made it up and, and uh, I made every mistake in the book. <laughs> you see, here's the thing. I find that a little bit hard to believe because um, I started listening to you when... You had Nikwe Pikicha as your newsreader. Yeah. And it, it used to bounce between Nikki and Katie Ketapodis. Yes. And Adam Gilchrist used to do your UK report. Um, I, I was in high school and my mom would be listening to you in the morning. So I'd listen. And then that's how I was like, oh my word, I, I, I don't think this John Robbie guy is half bad. Yeah, gosh. But you always struck me as somebody who just, who hits all the corners. You mm. are like kind of militant you know like you're german <laughs> you, you know you know it's seven o'clock we're not gonna you, everything is happening like yeah. this so when you say you don't know how many chats you've had i would have imagined that you're the kind of person who ticks every day and be like 5023 i tick every day and say gee was i still have a job <laughs> <laughs> no no ne never i mean i was it, it's so funny since i've retired and i retired just before christmas i can't believe eight months has gone by because it's it's gone like that uh, and i've sort of discovered a lot about myself and I've discovered that I'm actually a very lazy person. Re which, for somebody who got up at quarter past two for well, 17, 17 years, years and was never late once. That's quarter past two in the morning. In the morning. So that's in the morning. That's not in the afternoon after you eat your lunch day at work. <laughs> that's in the morning. Yeah? For, for a six o'clock show to, to, to start, you know, and everyone says, gee, the work ethic was amazing. Yeah. But 
there are a couple of things. One, it was because I was so passionate about what mm -hmm. I was doing. 702, the radio station, and this country, mm. this, this, this glorious country, which, mm. is, which is my country. And the other one, I suppose, is, is fear of failure. You know, it's almost like that, that as, as you took this, this show and, and it developed and, and, and became, I suppose, iconic, some mm. would say, yes. immodestly, I say yes. iconic. And, and then there's more to lose. Uh, so therefore, and it was the same, my wife reminded my wife, Jenny, who's been with me through thick and thin and all of this, and I love her very dearly. And, and she said, you know, think back to your rugby career. It was the same. When you were starting off, you, you know, you played and you did your best and you got nervous before a game. At the end of your career, when you hit 30, 31, 30, you were impossible. She couldn't see me in the morning of a game because you'd built up a reputation. Uh, therefore, you had that to lose. So I think fear, fear of failure and passion. Mm. were the absolute things that, that drove me. But if I'm not involved like something like that, gee, I'm lazy. You, you, you laid back, oh, you don't want to do man. anything. I'm lazy. Touching on fear, for people to move to another country, and I mean, you and I were having a quick chat about mm. Trevor Noah downstairs. Oh. I mean, to move to another country. Yes, he's gone and he's done well. That's not what we're going to discuss. To, be, to move from your support structure, from what you know, from your food, your streets, mm. your people, your heritage, to go to another country, what was... What was the deciding factor for you? Well, before I can get on to me, what, what Trevor Noah has done is so sensational. Yeah. And I've, I've never met him, but I feel like I know him. And, and to go to another country that is America, yeah. that is the center of world broadcast, whatever, and to get our show and then to take the top show and then to take... It is sense... I, I don't think half of South Africa realizes yeah. what, that, what that man has done. I mean, I, I came over as a, a dumb rugby player and I say it now with, with, with some uh, uh, shame. In the days yeah. when South Africa was isolated, the days of apartheid, I came and played rugby. I was an amateur rugby player. It was my life, yeah. my passion. Springboks to play rugby was there. But, you know, would now I wish I hadn't done it? Yes, I do. And, and every time I meet some politician who is in jail and, yeah. you know, when he was, and I'm trying to give him a hard time or was trying to give him a hard time, and I was coming and playing rugby. I, I feel ashamed about it. But, you know, I've worked my way but through it. But also you wouldn't be here if you I weren't wouldn't, here. I wouldn't be yeah. here. And then through all sorts of reasons, I ended up doing sport on, on this rock and roll radio station, 702. And I started. Now, this is the days. Youngsters, youngsters, youngsters. Before cell phones and Twitter and the internet. Yeah. I started something radical on my sports show, which was getting people to phone in when they got home, having been to the game. Oh, Listeners wow. would call in, believe me. In to those, give their take on the game. In those days, that was radical. And so I developed this repartee yeah. with the listeners. And then suddenly overnight, rumor has it over a bottle of scotch, Stan Katz decided because we had a terrible signal on 702 and 5FM had started or yeah. Radio 5 had started, we were losing revenue and listeners, because of the signal, we'll go talk. And of course, they were desperately looking for people. And here was this strange Robbie guy who talked to people. Yeah. So then they said, well, let's see. Seems to be getting a bit of political awareness through me on the radio. And, and, of course, I had this funny little talk show late in the evening, 10 o'clock, mm. and we had a no-holds-barred week, and I was having a great time. And a week later, FW stood up and said, uh, the world will never be episode. the same. And there was this funny little thing. And, and I mean, I was chatting to, to, to um, people b beforehand, to Andy beforehand, and, and saying that, that, again, talking about Trevor Noah, yeah. that in almost no country could someone do that come from the outside, serious issues, yeah. hold people to account, pontificate, all these things. But in those days, the whole basis of apartheid was segregation. Mm. So if you were black, you were in this box. If, if you, you were, were white, white, if you were Afrikaans, if you were yeah. a rugby player, everybody was in a box and everyone knew it. And then suddenly on this little show, there's this white guy mm. who's a rugby player, and yet he sounds like he's from the far left and he's yeah. so nobody could put me in a box and I think looking back on it that was, that was your advantage that was my incredible piece of luck and then of course I became part of the furniture became a South African and suddenly you're you're there but but it was crazy but but Trevor Noah never had that advantage mm. he's gone into the toughest market in the world and and I mean, I, I think you talk about presidential awards. I don't know if anyone would want an award from this particular president. <laughs> Am I allowed to say that? But, 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 uh, but, but that, there's a man deserves 
not just a presidential award, but a world award. He is my broadcasting hero. Okay, so on the way, this I don't want to talk about because you, 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 you say like going against the grain, against the grain, against the grain. I think for me, one thing sticks out about you going against the grain and it has to do with rugby and broadcasting. We'll put that all together. This is Real Talk, and we're giving you the chance to talk to John Robbie. If you'd like to ask him a question, send your voice notes through to the number that you see on the screen right now. We'll see you shortly after the break. You with Real Talk, and my guest this afternoon is former radio and television broadcaster John Robbie. Since arriving in South Africa in the 80s, John has gone through moments of being labeled a lot of things by a lot of people. <laughs> in the early 90s, he was called a socialist and communist for criticizing and speaking out against the apartheid regime by some white South Africans. And then at times, some black South Africans uh, have taken issues with some of, the, uh, some of his viewpoints, calling him a racist. No matter which way you look at it, certainly it sounds like a difficult position to have been in, but also a lovely one because he just was passionate about broadcasting so how do you convince people you're not a racist oh, I'm not a racist I don't even like athletics <laughs> oh. <laughs> that's where uh, that comedy is coming from I mean it, it's it's you can be called anything in South Africa but yeah. to be called a racist is the worst thing let's yeah. be honest that is it and it's a label and it's thrown around and and uh, you know, I think you have to sort of say to yourself, because racism is not just confined to South Africa. Mm. And I mean, I got, uh, I never thought I'd, 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 I'd say it, but you remember there was this extreme view that said black people can't be racist. Yes. Um, I said, this is, this, yeah. how this is, this is, an, oh, go on, go on. And, and my team on 702, who happened to be black South Africans, young, talented people, yeah. you know, there was an issue that came up about Serena, uh, and Venus Williams. Do you remember the students who dressed up as them oh, and the everything? The blackface. They, they call it, it blackface, that's yes. It, yeah. That's it, that's it. I was, I, and they explained to me how insulting it was mm. for these two iconic black women who'd gone against every uh, standard mm. and stereotype and had ruled the world. So, you know, why didn't they dress up as Maria Sharapova and, and so on? And then you sort of realize, hold on, let's, let's look at this more. And, and in the same way as you know, you say, what's the definition of anti-Semitism? Is, is people say, well, it's people who are anti-Jewish. Yeah, anti but it's not. Mm. It's anti-Semitic people, which is a lot more people than Jewish. But because of what has happened to Jewish people it, over Holocaust? the year, it has assumed a different, um, I don't know, a, diff a different flavor mm. to the definition. Mm. And anti-Semitism is now anti-Jewish people, it, the Holocaust, etc. Yeah, and everybody understands it. Well, if you look at racism to me so often in the world, not just in South Africa, it has been white people against, so I said it is different. Mm. Black people can be stupid and rude and bigoted and all sorts but of things. But they cannot be racist. But I don't think so. In a way, then, you have to say, well, well, hang on a second. John Robbie, who's always considered himself this very decent, fair-minded person, has been influenced by things. And, and I think that was part of my journey on radio, and part of my journey in life, mm -hmm. is that you can't stay the same. And one of the things that I think that, that, that perhaps set my show uh, separate from others was when I made a mistake, and I've made every mistake in the book. Hold on a second, I made a mistake. Yes. Sorry, I'm stupid, I I'm an idiot. That. Let me move on, yeah. where, do we, where do we go from here? And, and um, yeah, so, so the racism thing certainly hurt. Um, the, the, the Did you want to remind people that, wait a minute, because also with where we are in the world, which where we are as a country, and you were saying no Twitter, no Facebook and all of that, <laughs> is that we, our memories have gone, like, gone, gone to hell. There's no other way to say it, right? Yeah. So there's times when, you know, you, you say something and you're like, oh, my apologies. And then already people are like stoning you. Do you don't you want to put up your hand and be like, guys, wait a minute. In the yeah. 90s, I was the one telling the white people Absolutely. that this is not on. My, my biggest regret is I didn't keep a scrapbook. Because in those days, you had letters yeah. written. And the letters, the effort that people went to. <laughs> I mean, the favorite one that, that, I, that I, and I always recall, I don't, I don't have the copy, it was where somebody said, and it started off, uh, dearest Mr. John Robbie. Dearest. I thought, oh, that's so nice. And it's, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. you are an effing communist. I dream of pouring petrol over you, setting fire to it, and falling asleep listening to your screams <laughs> as you die a horrible death. Now, that's the effort that went into this letter. And it was signed, a concerned Christian. <laughs> 
<laughs> I mean, you know, you, 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 you can't make that up. How and, caring. And, and, yeah, in a, in a funny way, all that was a sort of a badge of honor because in the early days, yeah. in that incredible transition that South Africa went from, from apartheid to, to this new wonderful democracy, even though things were scary and, and you know, I'm not going to talk about death threats and, and things that happened because they were, they were real and, and, and people were getting killed, not, not for the moment. Yeah. And, but in a funny way, things were so much easier because you had this bizarre country where everyone had been, you know, so many people had been subject to propaganda from, from brainwashed mm. and they lived... And, and both they, sides. On, well, both, both sides. Whatever, whatever, but, yeah. but you, ha you had this situation and then suddenly this incredible opportunity came up because this country was headed to civil war, mm. all right? This country could have been Iraq, it could have been Syria, it could have been Rwanda, mm. it could have been mm. there. And then, thanks to Madiba, yeah. ANC negotiations, F.W. de Klerk, I mean, mm. let's give him credit. Uh, unlike a former colleague of mine did, let's give him credit for what he did. He crossed the Rubicon that, that P.W. couldn't. Mm. And anybody who could see there was this golden opportunity. So therefore, when you're dealing with these issues, if anything threatened this opportunity, this path to democracy, you could jump on it. Mm. And you could jump on it safe in the Whole knowledge heartedly. you were right. Now, of course, when you've got so many different issues in this democracy, mm. democracy of ours, there are so many, uh, many issues. So in a way, it's actually harder. And I think that's where, as a, as a, a talk show host, as, as somebody who's there uh, with a platform, mm. I think what you have to do is be sure of your principles. You have to be sure of your principles because then when something comes up, you can sort of say, well, let, let me go back to my principles mm -hmm. and let's see where we go. And I think that's why what's so sad about the political situation at the moment where you have this state capture, you have mm. this appalling government. Our appa principles can be bought. Appalling leadership. Yeah. And when you have brave people like Makosi Koza, like mm. uh, uh, Tuli Maranzella, Pravin Gordon, Matthew, these people standing up, and, and, and it's, it's fun to say, oh, it's white people. It's not mm. the people leading it. I think you have to say, you know, let's look beyond, as Pravin Gordon would say, the slogans, and let's look at the principles. And when you see the principles that are there, it's clear what's happening in this country. Is the issue not that, you know, ev everyone can be pinned to a little bit of dirt? Small and Yana skeletons, <laughs> of course. You know I, I think that when it comes to the leadership, it's that I almost feel like saying, okay, guys, everyone's skeletons, we're wiping them clean. Yeah. L l I promise you what, what you've done up to now. Let the one without blemish cast the first stone. And okay, then everybody yeah. move out and then let's get new in. But, but I, think, I think that's what's needed now is that, that people need to stand up and say, forget all that. The yeah. threats are gone. Whatever. Even people who've, who've accepted largesse yeah. in the past. And let's be honest. I mean, I once talked to uh, somebody from, from, from the struggle, from, from, um, who'd been in exile. Yeah. And we, we were friends. We played golf a little bit. We were friends. I can ask you something very personal. I said, how did it take... How did it take such a short time for the noses to get in the trough, for yeah. people to start? And, I, and he said to me, he said, because we never realized how easy it would be and how much there was. So you're coming, you've given your life, you're in exile, you've got kids to educate. Suddenly there's banks or businesses or guptas or whatever throwing money at you and saying this is the way it goes. This is how business... And it's human nature, it's to, human nature. to want to... To, to widen the gap between you and poverty. Of course. Especially of coming of from course poverty. Of it is. And once you've started, you know, Hansi Cronier, when he took his first <laughs> bribe, once you've started, how do you stop? And I think it needs people to, to say, hold on, it's gone mm. far enough. Let's, e even if it means some form of amnesty for this people. This is what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. That's saying, guys. Because it's happened up in the to past. now, whatever yeah. you have taken, yeah. it's yours. We don't Abs even want absolutely. it. Absolutely. Because Madiba must be spinning in his grave. We, we just, uh, what you've taken now, it's all yours. Yeah. But please, yeah. how did you become so into current affairs, though? Because th this is what I want to ask you about being a sportsman and broadcasting. Sportsmen, they're not the smartest. I think. <laughs> Well, I'm not so sure about that. There is a certain golfer uh, uh, on the American tour who's a graduate in physics who is changing the, the, golf, and the golf swing. It's, but I, I know what you mean. Sportsmen yeah. spend so much time focused 100% on sport. Maybe Actually, they lose other my, things. Sort of, I'm wrong. You're right. I'm wrong. Not the smartest eloquent when it comes to speaking, public speaking. Well, Muhammad Ali was quite so. Anyway, let's not, let's, let's not debate exceptions. I think, I think the point is you grow up. You grow okay. up. You, hit, you have kids. Suddenly your kids are there, you're living in a country, everyone's saying, get out of this country, it's going to, it's going to go the Zimbabwe yeah. route. I'm, and you have to get involved. And then you realize that, that, that politics is life, 
and, and it's more than that. There's the economy, everything. It's about people, it's about lives, it's about are you on the way up or are you on the way down? Okay. Do you care? And, and there comes a stage where, you know, worrying if Manchester United beat West Ham as they did yeah. on Saturday, For now. It's, not, it's not actually that important. <laughs> Whereas driving from the game and seeing people asleep under bridges mm. or begging on the side of the street, that is important. Mm. And then you say, what do you do? And, and of course, when you've got that, that, that incredible platform mm. of, of a morning show on a station like 702, and, and then, you know, for, for, former boss Terry Falkman came up with Lead SA mm. and said, in between all of this, let's, let's try and make a difference. Mm. And, and in a way, what, what really I found amazing was, because whenever South Africans get scared, they retreat into their little things and start lashing out. Mm. But when something bad happened, we would always say, okay, we can't do anything about that bus crash or that murder or that robbery or whatever. But we can do, so let's, let's find something and do something about, about it. And of course, people love that because it brought us all together again. And, and uh, yeah, I think, I think you have to be aware of what's going on. Right. Stay with us. There'll be more to come with John Robbie after this quick break. And welcome back to Real Talk on SBC3. The stage is yours. In the 1990s, a new dawn for South Africa was coming. John Robbie was offered an opportunity to stand in for then midnight host David Blood. John thoroughly enjoyed what he thought would be a short stint on air, uh, challenging his callers, even went as far as telling a woman from Pannoni to shut up during a duel on air, which, by the way, life got him back when Nelson Mandela told him to shut up. So, hey, look at that, it's a draw. <laughs> he left for Ireland to visit his family, thinking nothing would materialize from this experience. Uh, that was until Chris Gibbons called him back, saying, you started something here, and you need to come back. And so he did. And like they say, then the rest is history. <laughs> so, everyone... Your research is very good. <laughs> ah, you know what? Everyone says this about radio, that don't take leave. Yeah. <laughs> Don't, don't take leave and then it's a pause if somebody who you're not quite sure if is going to be standing in for you. I mean, after 17 years at the helm of breakfast, was that something at the back of your mind? Were you careful of who's like at your, at your, at your ankles? No, not, not really, yeah. not really. I mean, I, I was very conscious that, that, that being a, sport, a, a supporter of, 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 of transformation mm. in, in the country, and people would say, you know, you talk about that, but what is a white for a person from Ireland doing there. And I always said, look, at some stage, yeah. you know, it's, it's going to happen. And I'm, I'm confident that, that it'll be a, a transformative process yeah. coming through. But I mean, it was something, uh, something I discussed and something that 702 discussed. And I raised it on a number of occasions. Um, but I, I left because, uh, and it happened about two years ago, yeah. that, that I thought to myself, look, you know, I'm just turned 60. I'm 61 now. I've got two grandkids who, who sadly live in, 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 in England. Mm -hmm. uh, my kids are over there. And, and to get you know, tied into that five days a week, mm -hmm. getting up at 2.15, and very strictly, you can't go away. And I said, look, it's fantastic. And I'm well paid, not as well paid as I would have liked to have been, you know, <laughs> sorry. But, but, you know, I'm fine. But I said, if I want to do other things. And I believe that, that the time for talking is almost over now. Talking without doing is not good enough. And I said, I've been talking about things for 30 years, now I want to do some things or see if I can do those things. Mm. So I went to 702 about two years ago and said, look, it's coming to the end. Mm. And, and I'm delighted to say Kalani is in now. And, you know, I look at 702, I look at the transformation in the company from where mm. I was. And I say, that's the way it was. It just felt right. Let mm. me put it that way. All right. So we've got a WhatsApp voice now from someone. They've got a question for John Robbie. Hey, Anele, this is Malamli. I just want to ask a question to John Robbie. Like, um, how does one garner the necessary confidence to be able to, to perfect the job that you did as well as you did? So, like, um, how do you always keep motivated in order to be able to communicate perfectly? Thank you. Oh, that's right. what a nice question. And, um, yeah, I think you have to have a bit of confidence just to put yourself on the line. Mm. You know, you have, and especially in a live, a live show is, mm. is very, very different. You can't edit stuff out. Um, I think I was lucky in a way in that the pub culture in Ireland where I grew up, even though I didn't drink for a long time, I've sort of made up for it since. That's what I'm afraid <laughs> to say. But thank goodness for Uber. But, but, but in a pub culture in Ireland, it's storytelling. You know, it, it's storytelling, and we used to call it slagging. It's having a go, having this, picking targets, you know, coming up. Everyone in Ireland is an expert. And, and so you deal with it. And 
you know, someone, you'll say something and someone will put you down and you'll say, well, I'll take it on the chin. Well done. Thanks for putting me right. So I think, I think there was never that fear of being wrong. Mm. As long as you're prepared. If yeah. you're wrong, you, you, you learn something. And so often I would go to, you know, have a go at some politician or business person or something and he'd say, no, you're actually wrong. Mm. Well, tell me why. Here we are. So, so common, common sense. And, and the other thing I think was that, that, a bit like now, this is John Robbie. This is, you know, warts and all. And, and some people on, on radio or television are putting on a performance. You know, they're putting on a performance. They're pretending to be wacky or mm. silly or hard bitten mm. or something. I was just myself. I love this country. I, I was interested in yeah. what was going on. I had magnificent producers, but I always prepared my own show, my own, the, the way I was going to do it, the questions, etc. cetera. And, and, and so it was just be, me being me. And most importantly, you were yourself. I think yeah. people take that for granted that as a broadcaster, yes, everything else can come and enhance the product, which is you. But yeah. if the base of it, if the very soul of it is not who you are, it's going to You'll show. You'll be found out. Yeah. You'll be found out. But I also built a very good team. Yeah. I mean, a number of whom work with you. And, and when they started working for me, oh, I used to get the bosses coming and saying, people are in tears, you've been so... I was never nasty. Yeah. I always just set standards, set standards. And once those standards were reached, we had a fantastic time. Is there anyone you were ever scared to interview? Like they were scared, nervous, there was a little bit of fear as they walked in? Um, who would you be scared to? I don't think so. Mm. I mean, some people were, were very, very uh, intim in intimidating because, you know, when you got an opportunity, mm. when, when a Desmond Tutu came on, not that you could be scared of a Desmond Tutu. But because of his stature, it's, who he Exactly. Is. To blow an interview, to yeah. ask a stupid question or make a mistake or miss the obvious question. Mm. I think that was the, that was the, the, the hardest thing, you know. Um, my big regret was never in interviewing Madiba on air, uh. you know, but, but so many other people I, I, I interviewed and, and uh, yeah, I look back with you know obviously made mistakes uh. but with preparation I don't think I ever missed the obvious question mm. and then had learned that it's not just a question of a list of questions mm. you've got them there so that the the, the, the bases will be covered mm. but then you listen and then you're suddenly mm. listening and I always looked at the guests and you interviewed somebody famous you know whether it was Richard Branson or I don't know Chris Harney mm. or whoever whoever it was and They've done millions of interviews. So it's like there's a tape. Does anyone remember tape? Yes. Sorry, a disc, yeah, a disc, disc, a disc, yeah. a disc, a disc. And the disc is in their head. And they answer. They know how to churn out the same They're answering the things. questions. And then you get them. And suddenly they see it in the eyes. And yeah. thinking, hold on a second. Where are we? You know, yeah. where, hang on a second. Yeah. Where are, and yeah. that's when you know you've, you've got them. But you still have that, that question before. So I don't think, I don't think I've ever been scared to, 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 to interview any other than nervous that I might not do this opportunity justice. What, what was your, your crit process like for yourself? Because I know radio, we get crit every day from the bosses where they're like, that was great, try that again. You know, if you do mm. this again, go this way. But I mean, your personal one, like what was your... Jenny. Oh, Jenny, my really? wife. Okay. My wife, my biggest <laughs> critic and, and somebody I knew always totally on my side. Uh. But she used to do gym. She was a very big gym bunny. Mm. And she'd do it during the show. Uh, I'd get home. Oh, my word, you know. Mm. What are you, oh, this, that, and the other. And to have that. And also management at 702, you know, there were people there really trusted. Yeah. And they would sit and they could say to you. Because the biggest thing is, I mean, we're all paranoid. Let's be honest. We're all paranoid. We all suffer from this imposter syndrome mm. that we're going to be found out and the, as not clever. It mind. could end any and time now. It any, 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 <laughs> any time now. So, so some people, uh, management, deal with this by flattering, flattering. Yeah. Oh, you're so... What? But you don't want that because you think this is just false flattery. Yeah. Equally, the hard criticism is not there, but you need someone you know is on your side, mm. like a good uh, rugby coach. Mm. Somebody whose goal is the same, for you to be a better player and for the team to be better, for the team to be win. Mm. So let's look at it together. Here's an issue for me. What do you think about it? How about we try this? Let's practice it and we take it further. And um, those sort of people are, are few and far between. I was lucky to have them. Do you ever, did you ever find yourself being asked to crit other people's shows? Like people who are up and coming, they're like, please have a listen to this. You know, you are John Robbie, you know, see how I was, I'm doing. I, I was always, and I am passionate about passion. Yeah. I'm passionate about people who, who are not lazy. Yeah. Who, what they do, they do well. I'm passionate about people who want to aim for excellence. And I don't just mean excellence in a local sense. I mean world class. That's why Trevor Noah. Mm. That's mm. why Wade Van Nika, mm. Kasta Semenya. Mm. When we win a rugby, you know, it's South African and you've done something world. Our sevens rugby team mm. at the moment. 
We've done something. Our more. swimmers. Yeah, that's swimmers. You know? World class. Now, yeah. I'm passionate about that. So at 7.02, I would meet people, you know, because I've been at 3 o'clock in the morning. So I'd yeah. meet some news person who's reading on the graveyard shift or something, and I'd get, get to know them. And if I picked up that passion anywhere, I said to people, you can come to me anytime. Any time at all. And the nicest thing was that, that and there were other ones, of course, who knew it all. Fine, that's not a problem. That's yeah. not an issue. But the nicest thing was when I retired, so many people who are now household names, who I've forgotten about, came up and said, when I was in the mid, you know, I was at an all-time low and you came, and that, that was the nicest thing. I'd forgotten, forgotten all those things, so I like to think I made a, made a difference. Hey, there'll be plenty more of these stories to come right here on Real Talk. Do not go anywhere. And welcome back to Real Talk on SABC3. The stage is yours. So, for 17 years, John Robbie informed listeners through robust debates and engaging conversation with some of the most influential political elite. However, at times, listeners didn't always agree with some of John's views, uh, which led to some controversial moments. And it was always like, I'm, you know, John, I'm not happy with you. <laughs> it was all, you know, I think oh. my mom used to call into your show. Oh, really? Bless her soul. She used to call in, be like, mm -mm. What was her name? Yo, Lisa. You're Lisa from where? From Centurion. She's, she Could called be. you about the, remember when Pumzi Mlamunguga was in, in, in hot water about- the cranes. About uh, using a private plane. Yes, to, to yes, fly. yes. And she was like- To Dubai and yeah. she, she was visiting, like, looking at cranes. And, I do remember, yeah. And then my mom called, she was like, no one said anything when your leaders were flying oh, with, oh, with, 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 oh. with, with carcasses <laughs> that they'd hunted. In, 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 and, and like we in the car and we're like, mom, oh, just drop me off at brilliant. school. Oh, yeah, no, she used to have some- brilliant. Is she still with us? No, she oh, passed away shame, in 2009. Shame, shame, but shame, like, shame, but I mean, shame. She loved you, but she loved to hate you. I always <laughs> had the greatest respect for anybody who ever phoned. Yeah. Once they sent me to Australia uh. Uh, to listen to a guy called Alan Jones, who, yeah. even though we're very different, was my sort of model yeah. in terms of professionalism. Also rugby background. And he's done morning talk in Sydney for 40 years, oh, Alan wow. Jones. And I thought, because I listened the first day, and then I went in and watched, and I mean, he, was, he was fantastic. And I decided just for fun, because I was coming back to do a presentation to 702 about talk heard. radio. And I said, I'm gonna phone in, I'm gonna phone in. So I phoned in and so I got a call about something. And I was on hold and I was on hold and then I chickened out. <laughs> you see now. I was so scared to phone in. So anybody who ever phoned in, I have the greatest respect for. Let's talk about your controversial moments. Uh, being booted off breakfast on 702 by Gareth Cliff. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there was, a, there was Gareth and I mates. Gareth yes, and I yes. mates. He wants to um, weather on my show. Can you believe it? So he didn't produce for you? He, he, he's, he did produce for a while, yeah. I think. Yeah. But I, I, I'll be honest, I don't remember. Call it a senior moment. But at one stage, to introduce a bit of humor, we ha had a weather reporter, and he pretended to be a farmer from Donker Hook, okay. an Afrikaans farmer in between. It was very, very funny. Yeah. And Gareth has his self-confidence uh, about him, was, was marvelous. But, but, but 702 messed with the brand. You know, mm. 702 messed with the brand. And, and it's funny, if you look at the history of 702, whenever there was a real quest, whenever there was a mission, you know, whether it was to, to deal with the old South Africa, bring it yeah. into the new South Africa, whether it was the build up to the elections, whether it was crime, whether it's now state capture, yeah. poverty. You know, once there's a mission, Lead SA, and yeah. that was the whole basis yeah. of Lead SA. Once there's a purpose. It, it, it sort of galvanized the station. Yeah. And there was a time where, before Terry Falkvane took over, I think 702 was sort of going nowhere. It was whinging about crime. I, sh I shouldn't say whinging, as crime is a massive problem. But when you're listening all day, and it's the same old calls, this, that, and the other, this, And that, it's also the other. one thing to talk about it, but to talk about it... Without trying to do yeah, something. Exactly. Without, trying without, to do a, something. without like hey, a focus. Hey, like, exactly. Then we're all just talking, guys. And I think 702 took its eye off the ball, and they started going, you know, more silly. Mm. radio and Gareth was amusing and he was great and he was terrific and he came in but the brand of 702 had an integrity about it it had a currency about it to do with mm. current affairs about the country mm. about we care we work together and I think they messed with the brand and so it, you were on breakfast and then he yeah, was on and then yeah. you came back oh, on it happened to me a number of times Jenny Jenny Cruz Williams came in to do a hard bitten news yeah, show yeah. I mean it, it, it was the crazy years in a way mm. I look back and I say you know that inmates had taken over the institution <laughs> <laughs> and I suppose I should have left. But, you know, I always thought, you know, 
don't get mad, get even. Uh, and as the late Doc Craven always used to say, outlive your enemies. Yeah. So I always sort it's of the thought, one way to win. I always thought I'm not going to leave having gone off in a huff and said I got left on the morning show. Mm. I, I'm going to learn how to do it better and go back and come back. And then I think seven or two got it together and, uh, and we took off. That's something to be you know, applauded though, because radio personalities, we all ego, you know, it's, yeah. it's no, you know, I should, I, I'm there, I'm better, I'm going to leave, I'm not going to do it. So for you to be like, you know what, it's okay. Yeah. You know, I, let, me, let me suss this out. Let Maybe me I was see. scared. Maybe I was scared I wouldn't get another job Aww. somewhere else. No, but I loved 702. Yeah. I loved the, the, what it stood for. Mm. You know, that it was always part of a community. And, and I know some people decry this, you know, Desmond Tutu's idea of the rainbow nation and mm. say it's come by. Well, that's what my dream is mm. because I see it every day. I see ordinary people being nice to each other, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Despite all the massive problems of, of inequality and unfairness, I believe in the rainbow nation. And I say it unashamedly. And that's what 702 was and is and uh, I know this was one of your last controversial moments the, the hair with the Pretoria goes high oh, for someone who doesn't have very much hair isn't, you, that, isn't that ironic yeah, yeah and, and, and I think that the sensitivities and Twitter and social media yeah. I mean it was such a crazy issue and and it hurt it yeah. hurt to be called a racist and you know as I'm sure when people ask Pravin Gordon what did you do in the struggle you yeah. know for goodness sake and, and I think that there's 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 I mean, young people are, are fantastic, and they always are in every generation. Yeah. But there's also a militancy, and there's a fascism mm. among certain young people now, which is scary. And I think that there's young what people... What is that? Like what? Well, Drive this, this, and passion this without fee, thought? Fees must fall. Okay. Fees must fall. You know, I always remember that, that one student who stood up there with a placard and said, I don't know, something other. Mm. And he got hit and knocked and trashed. And you can't, you can't talk, about these, talk about these issues, you know? I mean, yes, it'd be lovely to have free education for everybody. And education needs to be jacked up, all those things. Mm. But the target is not the universities. Mm. The target is the government. The people who The target you. is the government. And, and, and um, you know, this, this, as I say, the fashion, fascism of the left mm. can at times be just the same as the, as the fascism of the right. And, and I was stuck in the middle of this innocuous conversation. Mm -hmm. about hair and a you know militant lady said to me you have no right to speak about black mm -hmm. ladies hair Do and the issue was and I said you know what about freedom of choice uh, freedom of speech, thought freedom yeah. of speech etc and of course it became then and 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 because of time constraints and I listened to it afterwards. You can't open the conversation. You know, it was, it was, and this is one of the problems with morning radio, mm. because you're dealing in these little windows, mm. because you've got business and traffic and all the things that people need. And I listened to it and it sounded, gosh, you were a bit hectoring. You sounded like you were hectoring. Mm. Instead of, you know, being cool and saying we can, we can differ whatever and, and maybe taking the issue further. And next second, this Twitter war erupted. Mm. And I was being, you know, I was being called Penny Sparrow. And I also it was think- painful. It's because you don't necessarily get the backstory of what, of how political our hair is. Of course and I it, get it. Of do course you? I get one hundred percent. I get it, and 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 I'm totally understand that. I mean, yeah. I've got producers who've spoken to me. We've done programs about yeah. that. But the other thing is, is with, with with the world today, and I'm not a Twitter fan. Yeah. I understand in a revolution Twitter when they've closed down the, the radio stations Twitter is vital and spreading yeah. I understand all of that but the rubbish and the <laughs> insult and the cruelty yeah. of, of, of unnamed faceless people bullying bullying other people yeah. I think is, is, is absolutely crazy and the way many media out of journalistic laziness just go what just go there's a Twitter yeah. war has a, okay. I mean I'll give you an example when 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 I retired people were so nice to me and instead of wanting to shoot me or kill me or torture me or do this as happened in the past sometimes people were mostly pretty nice and mm. they thought this Robbie guy's been around a long time he's basically quite a nice guy and the reaction on air, none of which was set up, and the reaction on Twitter, and it was lovely. Mm. There were some bad ones. So one of the newspapers took four tweets, and the headline was, you know, not, some people are delighted, and they made a story out of that, you know. Mm. And I thought, ugh, time to yeah, go. Yeah, okay, journalists are very time, lazy. Time to go, time yeah, to go. Time. Time to but we also, in. as we get older, we get sensitive. Yeah, because I know with that hair <laughs> thing, because I, I was like, does John not understand, like, it's a thing for us. You know, I have friends who go to work, and... You know, their bosses will be like, you look like a shaggy dog. Yeah. Now, I love the hairstyles. I love fashion. I, I love... But the point was, the issue was about standards in a school. Yeah. All right. 
but the issue for some was about racism yeah. and sexism. But and as a talk show host, I'm saying, well, hold on a second. Now, what do you say off the cuff, mm. transcribed onto a Twitter thing? Mm. And I think, I, I mean, what am I? I'm not, fit to, I'm not qualified to talk about hair, let yeah. alone yeah. women's hair, let yeah. alone, you know. And I think I said something about where this, you know, calls were coming. And I think I said something like, um, uh, w w where do you draw the line? Mm. Some people's hair is is showbiz and over the top. Oh yes, you said our hair showbiz. showbiz. Yes, and really that got translated as John Robbie says, all black women's hair is showbiz yeah. and over the, which is patently not, you know. But as Helen Zillers found, you know, once the floodgates open, you don't. But I was very upset, and uh, um, Tuli Madanzella phoned into the show. Yeah. And spoke to she the was producers. there the next day as well. Well, she phoned in to say, look, I can see where John's going to, you know, that the, the trouble here, can I talk to him? And I think she meant have a quiet cup of tea. But my, my clever producer said, no, 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 no. Let's do this now. Come in. Came in the next day, talked about unintended offence and talked about oversensitive victimisation and put the thing in perspective. Mm. And it went away. But I learned from it. After the break, we find out how retirement has been treating John. He's got so many things up his sleeve. He's even become a comedian. Not that he was never funny, but I mean, <laughs> it's official now. He's on stage. He's making us laugh, people. Stay with us. <laughs> Welcome back to Real Talk. As is the case with everyone in their career, there comes a point where it's time to just step down, put your feet up and enjoy retirement. John Robbie has been trying out new things since leaving the broadcasting world. So John, we're curious. <laughs> <laughs> more golf, more sleep? Yeah, no, more, more golf, more sleep, definitely. Uh -huh. Although no one has told my dog that, you know, I don't get up at 2.15 oh, in the so morning. Dog the dog up gets now. up and goes for it, yeah, at 2.15, so I have to get up, but I go back to sleep. Okay. Yeah, no, it, it's, been, it's been great. I mean, I said I wanted to do things. Mm. So I'm involved in a couple of things, and one of the things that, that, that troubled me was the way professional sports people end up in trouble because they haven't managed or been managed. Good. So I'm involved in a company. Uh, it's, 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 it's called um, the Sport Exchange, mm. Sport exchange mm. it was called the sports exchange but then people thought that was the sports sex change oh and oh it Lord. led to all sorts of problems that's a little a little fun but it's true yeah. a sport exchange that that amongst other things looks at managing sports professionals yeah. and transitioning them from their sport career into another career and i'm very excited about it mornay duplessis is the chairman of the company i wish that would be across the board to to actors, to musicians, absolutely, to, to anyone absolutely. who's a freelancer, because you know, at the very least, you are a freelancer when you do those absolutely. things. Absolutely, learn how to manage yourself, your brand, your career, where it's going, what you're putting well, away. This, this way, there are experts who do that for you, yeah. and it's in their interest because as you go through, it's backed by a big company that did my pension okay and that's how i got to know it and so the idea is the sports people transition many of them fall by the wayside yeah. here we help them transition into another career they take that forward the pension then gets and they end up having it and they can concentrate on their sport yeah. so that's one thing i'm involved in i'm involved in another, another company called circa that mm -hmm. does um uh, big uh, corporate entertainment the big sporting events mm. etc et an old friend of mine called lee thomas mm. who's doing a fantastic job and I love that. I love that side of things. Another company called Century that does um, affordable housing. Okay. Uh, something I'm I passionate know, about, about as well. They also put schools in and they also build old age homes. No jokes, please. <laughs> so I'm doing, I'm doing some marketing with them. I'm speaking at a function. And then I've also decided that I need to be pushed out of my comfort zone. Uh. So when this, this reality TV show came up and said, would you like to do a stand up? at Parker's Comedians, yeah. you know, thing, comedy club, and you'll be schooled by a famous comedian. I said, you're going to regret this, but I said, yes. And I've just had one of the most fascinating uh, experiences, Cajiso Ledija. Uh, Ledija. Yeah. What a fantastic guy. He schooled me, and on Monday night, on another channel, yeah. that is the, the Comedy Central, that's going to be shown at 9 o'clock, so you'll see me never been so scared in all my life. And then going out, and, you know, don't die on stage, will yeah, John? Well, I'm, I won't say what happened. <laughs> that, that was fascinating. And then Bernard Jay uh, of the Nelson Mandela Theatre came to me and said, would you like to do pantomime? He's been trying to get me to do pantomime. Didn't your mom 
Mamma Mamma in Ireland did the amateur yes. panto for the kids at Christmas and won the undying love of every family because it kept the kids yeah. out of out of mischief. Entertained. And I've always been a bit of a thespian. I say thespian very carefully. And Bernard Jay's always been on to do it. And he got me almost immediately. I, I retired, announced my retirement. He said, well, you can't get out of it this year. Yes. So Janice Honeyman and I had a chat. And there was only one condition, I said. It's not a guest. I want to do a full professional role. So next year, not this year, next year, Snow White. Yeah. I am playing a, the major supporting role in Snow White. Are you one so. of the dwarves? <laughs> grumpy. <laughs> yeah, <I'll, laughs> my wife is falling in front of the thing now because I can be very grumpy. So, and I'm going to India. We're uh -huh. going to India for a holiday. I always wanted to go to India. I'm going to do uh, scuba diving. Mm. I'm going to do skiing. I'm going to anything that pushes me out of the comfort zone. And, and, um, no, I'm not dying. It's not a, a bucket not list. A bucket okay, list no, no. It's not I Jekyll just, Nicholson and Morgan Freeman. No, <laughs> as I said, I, I, you know, if I've, I'm retiring now to do other things. Yeah. Business-wise, work-wise, to make a difference, and 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 I passionately believe that that you know, with with, with politics being so grubby mm. and dirty and poisonous and toxic now, and I say that absolutely. You know, it's almost like. It was the sexy thing. Mm. The new South Africa, everything was politics. And politics is always important. But I think now, a lot of people in other areas, whether it's business, whether it's the economy, whether it's entertainment, whether it's medicine, whether it's police, those people have almost felt, you know, we're unsexy because we're out of politics, politics. Mm. But I think now the message is it's time to do things, to employ, to mm. make things, to sell to things, to create we things, need to, to create. make people The only happy. way we're going to get out yeah. of the, the economic slump we're in yeah. is if we create and we encourage inventors, Absolutely. people who can invent things and so that we can sell them across the world. But that needs for our education. It, it needs it to get better. It, but politics is not the premium one. That is secondary to all these other things. And the biggest one is tourism. Mm. I'm also looking at, at a tourism, maybe bringing in some tourists to South Africa. Because I've noticed so many of my friends come kicking and screaming into South Africa because I think they're going to be mugged or killed. Yeah, or what's yeah. You know, a famous friend, I've mentioned him before, who very successful businessman in Ireland, came out of ORT like that yeah. five years ago. He's been here seven times since. He's bringing his own people over now. He is now the great authority in Ireland. Get people here once. If I had one job I'd love, yeah. it would be Minister of, of Tourism. Tourism. By jingo, I'd make things kick. Somebody on Twitter says, uh, the thing I miss the most about him on the show is the what's the question? Ta da! Ta da! <laughs> <laughs> it's so it's so crazy. I mean, I don't know where that came from. Uh, we had this little thing. What's the question? Yeah. Ta da! Ta da! And suddenly everybody, and it became a catchphrase. And you know, the, the, what cut the slush? And mm. please call me John. And you know, you yeah, lie like call me John. you lie like Hannah a cheap Robbie. you lie like a cheap carpet. <laughs> All these little <laughs> phrases that I came, you know, and, so, and it's so much fun, you know. It's so Another much fun. one that's coming through major on Twitter is tell him I sent you. Tell him I sent you. <laughs> Khalik Suit sent, and I say it now. They're the most wonderful people. They came from the Oriental Plaza. Yeah. They're this wonderful family of people. And they started this business in Santon. And yeah. I suppose good old racists said, who's this bunch of Indian mm, Muslims mm, in mm. Santon? And they, they, they came on with one advert for a tuxedo, mm. 330 rand. And my son was going to all these Debs dances. And I was hiring these blooming tuxedos. So I did the read and I said, do yourself a favor. They never hire, buy tuxedos. You'll save yourself a fortune. And suddenly they had queues around. And from then they've gone on to be our biggest, uh, I think, single advertiser. They've become family friends and they're the most wonderful, wonderful people. Not because they're on 702, because they back it up with service and, uh, and value. And I do not have a contract. I do not work for them in anything. I'm just proud. I'm just proud about. that they started off with one ad. And they've gone on and, and done so well. Tell him I sent you. Tell him I sent you. And with that, we come to the end of our time with Mr. John Robbie. Call me John. Uh, <laughs> we'll be back tomorrow, 5 p.m. ACBC 3. Thank you so much for your time. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Cheers. Tell him I sent you.
cheeky.